If you ask me who my God is, on whose name I call, if you ask me who my God is, He's the God of us all, Allah the Merciful. If you ask me what my book is that I hold in my hand, if you ask me what my book is, it's the Holy Quran, the Holy Quran. Hmm. Assalamu alaikum and peace, and welcome to this episode's Misconception. I'm your host, Muhammad Hashim, and today we are speaking with uh, Sheikh Yusuf Esther. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. We also have in our studios, our studio audience. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, on today's show, our misconception for today is Islam's women. I guess their position in Islam, and where they stand, and how people perceive them. So, Sheikh, how can we begin Islam's women? What can we say? What can we talk about? One of the things I think would be immediately obvious to anyone watching our program is that we're men. So where does the woman fit into this story? Yeah. And as we go along through the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about what Islam really teaches about women, what their role is, and what some of the misperceptions might be amongst the Muslims and non-Muslims alike. As always, I think it's important to include our audience especially students of knowledge who are seeking to become better acquainted with what Islam is really about. If we could start with that. We should go straight to the audience, inshallah. Any questions from the audience? Yes, Sheikh. Uh, yes, I go have ahead. question is, yes. some people say that the women in Islam are oppressed because they cannot be leaders. Is that true? Oh, okay, right. I think about I, women being leaders. leaders. I get a lot of questions about why women can't be imams. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question. I can, can't be what? Imams. Imams? Uh, prayer leaders. Prayer leaders, yeah. yeah. yeah I, well, I've heard that too, that, that uh, even some women themselves have said that, you know, why can't we get out here and lead prayers and, and be teachers and so on? Well, let's begin at the very beginning of that subject. If we're going to talk about leadership, leadership in Islam is something very key. And to us, the leader of all, of course, is going to be Muhammad, peace and blessing peace be upon him. And none of us would ever suppose that we would be equal or even close to him in his capacity to teach us and lead us in Islam. After that would be the immediate companions of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. And we could look to them and see how they understood these things and what they did. We might be surprised to find out, though, that the word imam, leader, we call a prayer leader the imam, is related to another word. If you know the root of the Arabiya, you find that the word for mother, Om, is from the same root as Imam. So when a woman becomes a mother, she is already a leader. Whereas if I lead the prayer as an Imam, as soon as I say, Salaam alaikum, Salaam alaikum, peace be upon you, at the end of the prayer, I'm finished. I'm not the imam anymore, right? Whereas all of the early women of the Prophet ﷺ, his wife who died and his uh, other wives, were always called leaders. They were called mothers of the believers. That's how we translate it, mothers of the believers. But actually, they are the figureheads for us as female leaders themselves because they are the um. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Well, as a matter of fact, I was very shocked when I found out that, yes, because it makes sense to me, because I always looked at my mother as being a leader. Yeah, me too. It's naturally, you know. Let me give you an example about something when it comes to this. This is in all languages, actually, when we talk about what is your mother tongue? What's your mother language? Why do we say that? Because we learn from who? Our mother. Your mother is the one who first teaches you to speak. And this is recognized in Islam right away by talking about these mothers of the believers. Even though, look at this, some of his wives never even had children at all. In fact, the only children surviving were really from his first wife, Khadija. Yeah, I was going to ask you that if women don't have children, are they, still, are they still leaders? They are very much leaders because we don't look to our women as being second class when it comes to education nor in their leadership of teaching. 
For instance, the Prophet, peace be upon him, encouraged all the Muslims to get education. As much as you can get education, this is important about Islam. It's not necessary to be a pharmacist or a doctor, as many people would like to see their children be, which is nice, but what's the focus is to know about Islam. And you must educate the women, or else how will you propagate the truth of Islam? Because after all, if the woman is teaching you how to speak, then obviously she's the first one to influence you with religion. Teach one, teach one man and you've taught one person. Teach a woman and you've taught a whole nation. Hmm. There you go. I, I've never heard that, but oh, really? I like that. Okay. I, no, I never heard that. Yeah. Teach a man, you taught, taught one person. Only one person, and teach, teach a, woman, a woman, you've taught the whole taught nation. The nation. Well, that mm. that fits the description really in Islam, mm. because our mothers and our daughters and leaders. our wives are all Lead. leaders in that capacity. But by the way, we need a proof, and I would like to offer you a proof. In Egypt, there is a famous historical university that's been ongoing for uh, about a thousand years or more. Anybody know the name of that university? Al-Azhar. Well, you should know it. (laughs) Yes. And who was the very first dean, the first of all for this was a woman. Did you know that? First of all, the uh, the Fatimid dynasty to teach uh, uh, as the the grand professor, if you will, or the you know rector of the whole thing was a woman. woman. Yes. So this misconception that women can't be leaders is wrong. Now some people would say, well, hold on a second. We heard that Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that Allah curses a nation if a woman tries to lead it. That isn't the way he said it. What he said was that. The curse of Allah is being on what? A nation that women are having to lead because of why. Although he didn't give the reason, but you can understand. Because if the men are too lazy, or too inept, or too uneducated, or don't desire leadership, that the women have to take this role, then this is a nation which is not really out there in the right way. Why are men leaders? And the reason is because Allah has made one over the other, not in his brilliance or education at all, but rather that one is out here, he's supposed to be working for a living to support his family. A woman is not supposed to have to support the family. That's a very important issue. Yeah. So women can be leaders, they can be teachers, but they shouldn't be leading the prayers. Why? Because when we pray, we bow down on the ground. And if a woman's bowing down in front of you and you're distracted from your prayer, then your prayer could be lost. But women praying behind men, they're not distracted by men praying in front of them. Yes. And by the way, women are not even ha- don't even need to go to the masjid to pray. They don't need to go to the mosque to pray, do they? No. no. Where do they get the most reward? At home. At home. That's what the Prophet ﷺ said. He said the men get the most reward in the mosque. Getting the men out of the house, get the men, even if they don't have a job, still he has to get out of the house to go pray, right? Mm -hmm. The women really like that. Get that guy out of here. He's a nice guy. I like him. He's my husband. But I had enough. Get out. (laughs) And many women are tired of men working at home because he gets underfoot. She'd like to do this or that. There he sits. And he's saying, don't bother me. I'm the computer. Don't bother me. I'm on the phone. She said, what am I going to clean? What am I going to do anything? This man, he's in the way. So in this case, the woman says, I'm, I'm going to go out and get a job and get out of here, you know? Yeah. And so it's a reverse role. But Islam is showing us, let the woman have her time to do what she wants to do the way she wants to do it. You get out, get a job. If you don't have a job, get out, go to the masjid. She'll get more reward by praying at home. That's what the Prophet said. It's beautiful, isn't it? That makes sense to me. Yeah. So leadership definitely starts with the mother herself. So it's very miscon- big misconception, especially amongst Muslims who are pushing the girls to go out and become, you know, in the role of the men, trying to make money, trying to, uh, you know, have careers and things because, not because they can't do it, but because if she's doing that, then she studied, she's got a career, now when she gets married, what's going to happen? She has to quit? She said, I did all this work for what? Just so I can get married to this guy who wants me to have children. Now, I want to follow my career. Yeah. It causes problems. Let the young girls go through what they like to go through, do what they like to do, and naturally grow into what they're interested in.
That's as simple as that. If she does want to be a doctor, fine and good. We need women doctors to take care of our women. That makes sense. Yeah. But not pushing them, you see. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Sheikh, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, some, some say that uh, Muslim women are forced to stay at home. What's the correct answer to give to a person which asks that kind of question? That's a really good one because after what we just said, now people might perceive it as we are forcing our women to stay at home. But we're not, are we? No, there are limits, by the way, though. We have to be clear about this. There are limits. A man should not be sitting at home and his wife going out to work. This is the opposite of the teaching of Islam. The Quran is the foundation of Islam. And it tells us in chapter 4, verse 34. The very first word is rajul. This does not mean mankind. It means males. Rajul. The rajul, the male, is over the woman in what respect? In getting out, earning a living, paying all the bills. Even if she's wealthy, the man must pay the bills. This is very, very important. Now, the first wife of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was quite wealthy. In fact, she was one of the most wealthy women of the whole entire area where they lived. Yep. She owned a business that was inherited from her father. She married a man who died. She married another man, and for whatever reason, didn't work out. But she kept her wealth. And when she married Muhammad, peace be upon him, she could have, according to Islam, she could have easily kept everything. But guess what? She spent everything she had, her entire fortune, helping Muhammad show the people what's the true Islam, supporting the Muslims. Okay, then we're going to have to go to a quick short break, inshallah. And when we do return, we'll continue about Islam's women and position of women in Islam. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Amazing stories. In this program, we get to know about people of the past whose stories were mentioned in the Islamic tradition and related by the Prophet, peace be upon him. That verily us, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we tell you about the best of the stories. We tell you about the best of the stories. When we narrate a story, when we read a story, when we try to benefit from a story, what we are trying to do in reality is to go back through the steps, through the different parts and sections of this story until the story is actually completed and that we can take the actual benefit directly from the story. Sheikh Lutfi will narrate these stories in his program Amazing Stories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered one of the lands to come closer, the destination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered one whole city to come closer, to move closer to this dead person. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Misconceptions. And today's misconception is Islam's women, the position of women in Islam, and I guess how people, Muslims and non Muslims, perceive the woman. So, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. So, we're talking Salam about the misconceptions about women. We've had so many questions from the audience, I think they might have a couple more, but would you like to add anything? As we're moving along on here, we're seeing that there could be misconceptions both from Muslim and non Muslim alike. What I'd like to do now is uh, find if we have any other questions from our brothers here in the audience. Yeah, I yes, have a question, Go ahead. Uh, some, some people say uh, women worship their husbands. Okay, now in a previous what about program, uh, we d talked about this subject before. Yeah, I think that, we have. Uh, because of, there's a verse in the Quran talking about women being devoutly obedient. In parentheses, I've seen it added to their husbands, devoutly obedient to their husbands. And this, of course, was added by a husband. <laughs> There's no doubt about it mm. that that's how that came about. So how do we understand that? Well, first of all, it didn't say that. 
It's said because the husband's taking care of her. He's responsible for finances. He's responsible for taking care of all the women in the house. And for this reason, she's devoutly obedient. To who? To Allah. Allah. It says Allah gave him the authority uh, that actually gave him this position. So she's obedient to Allah. It's impossible to be anything else because in other verses of the Quran, it's clear that even though the parents, by the way, who have a bigger a bigger uh, due to them from all of us. We have to give parents what is their rightful due. We could never obey a spouse if it was disobedience to Allah. We just can't do that. We can't disobey our parents except if they want us to disobey Allah, right? So that's how that works. Mm. I've had instances where men have told their women not to go to their sick mother and see their sick mother and women have said, well, my husband said so, so then I can't go visit my sick mother. In this case, you go to the very next verse. It says when they're having these kind of difficulties between them, you appoint somebody from both their families and let them mutually work it out and then both of them have to accept that if they really want to work it out because we know that sometimes a man or a woman could really get out there and have a condition which is really odd, really weird. And if that's the case, their other relatives would come in and settle the thing and you work it out and say, come on, you know, let your let your wife go to her sick mother. And on the other side, come on, fix the guy's breakfast in the morning the way he wants it. You know, let's work it out. It has to be a nice balance again, doesn't it? It says it in that's very then the, absolutely the next verse. It's chapter 4, verse 34, talking about the role of the man and the woman. Then immediately chapter 4, verse 35, how to get resolution if there's any difficulty between the two of them. Okay, we can uh, direct um, to the studio audience again. Any other questions regarding the yes. role of women? Okay, I go ahead, questions. brother. Yes. Two women equal one man in business contract. Business can, you, con- can you give us a short comment on that? Okay, mm-hmm. now... Business contracts and even yeah. when... Witnesses well, yeah, marry. This is in uh, chapter 2 of the Quran, verse 282. It's the largest verse in the entire Quran, and it deals with contractual agreements. It's a very clear business statement here that anytime you're going to do business, write it down and get witnesses so that there's no problem later in the matter. Very clear. But how do we understand the fact that it says that if you're not able to get two men, you can get a man and two women. So it appears initially that, oh, you're saying that two women equal one man. But actually, that isn't what's intended at all. That's the way it comes across. Yeah, very much comes across that way because the numbers are there. But if you understand the condition of the women, especially at that time, and throughout history, many times the women are not as familiar with business dealings and contracts as the men might be. And you might be explaining it to her and she's busy with a child or she has other things in her mind and she says, I don't remember that, what was said. And the other one would remind her. And that's what it says in the Quran that the other one would remind her. That's all. Didn't say that she's dumb, she doesn't understand. But if there was any distraction whatsoever, you've got three witnesses now just to be sure. That's that's all. Not saying one's better than the other. Never was implied that way. And there is historical evidence to the contrary that for sure women are plenty good to do business because if we go back to what I said earlier, Khadija, the first wife of the Prophet Sallallahu she was herself one of the best business women maybe in history. There's no doubt about it. It's very important, Sheikh, that you mentioned that. I didn't know to that detail. Very important, yeah. Because a lot of people do take it as the man is is, is better than the woman, and you need two men. Huh? Yeah. yeah do we have any other question about it? Hmm. I would really like to hear you explain one question, which I usually get okay. from non-Muslims, is about that Muslims, Muslim men, are forcing the women to cover up and hide. They're demanding from them that okay. they must be covered. And That's a fair question, and actually. There is this going on amongst some Muslim men. However, this is not what Islam teaches. Because I've been in homes where when I enter, they want to make sure all the women 
are hiding in another room and they never come out. They can't walk through and they might even tell you, oh, the lady, she needs to pass through. Will you go in another room so she can walk through to go out? You're like, what? What are you talking about? Because at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there wasn't anything like this that women, except for his wives. Now, his wives were different because these are the mothers of believers. These were uh, survivors after he died and they, they were protected from men, unwanted, uh, you know, glances at them or uh, advances from them, things like that. But other than that, the, all the women have always been free to move about, do what they need to do provided they stay within normal restrictions. Because everything in Islam is about rights and limits. Rights and limits. There's always this balance. So in some cases where people get too familiar, it causes problems of jealousies, envy, and unwanted advances. So we don't really want to put anybody in that position. You might say, well, then nothing will happen. But you don't know that. Like the Prophet, peace be upon him, peace told us him. never to have a man and a woman alone together because if a man and a woman are alone together, the devil will be the third. And he will come to people and cause them to have these kind of thoughts. So it's better just to protect yourself. So if a woman needs to go to the grocery store and she's passing through the house, she's not going to go through there improperly dressed. So we do have a dress code, yes. But it is not that she's being forced. She's doing it because she wants to be protected. Uh, one of the things I hear women say is, I want to be recognized for my mind, for my talents, not for the shape of my body. And that's what the covering is for. That's what the protection is for. Even when they pray, we put a wall up somewhere so that they can pray behind it. That way they can remove their covering if they would like to. You know, when they're listening to a talk, maybe they have a child, they want to nurse their child. How can they do that? So this is why we erect these uh, partitions, not to uh, bother them, but actually to help them. Hmm, not to necessarily oppress them and put women in a... Actually, two women space. came to Islam from this very thing. And what happened was, they came and asked me, why you have this partition here? And so I got to ask them about their religion. Well, for them, they have, their best women are the nuns who absolutely wear almost the same clothing that our good women wear. But they cannot get married. And I asked them, can they have children? They said, no, they can't have children. I said, why? They said, because they can't get married. I said, why can't they get married? They said, because they're married to God. Yeah. I said, whoa, all of them? Whoa, you shouldn't have a problem with us having more than one wife then. <laughs> now, what I ask them about, if the best of your women can't get married, the best of your men can't get married, they're priests and preachers and so on, they can't get married. So if the best men and the best women can't get married and have children, that means only the worst of your people are getting married and having children, right? What kind of society are you going to So what kind of society exactly... <laughs> And so I said, now you're worried about a partition we erected to protect our women, to give them a place that they can relax and nurse their children. And I'm asking you now, why do you have a partition between common sense and your society? Why not let the best of your men and women get married? Do you know what happened? Yeah. I told this story many times when I went back to that same community. It's down in Florida. Do you know what the brothers told me? They said, Sheikh, after you left, both of those women came back, entered Islam, and they're sitting on the other side of the partition right now. Alhamdulillah. Can we get one more, qu one more question from the audience before we wrap up? We're, we're nearly out of time. so. Yes, I, I have questions. Okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, men must beat uh, uh, their women. Men must beat their women. Yeah, you get that a lot. Yep. All Muslim men beat their Muslim okay. wives. Okay, this is taken from the same verse in chapter 4, verse 34 of the okay. Quran. They translated wadribahuna as beating your women. And this is Muslims who mistranslated it. Strike, beat, scourge, all of these words were used. But the most correct opinion on this one, inshallah, God knows best, is that the daraba can only mean at the maximum a touching on them similar to way a doctor examines a patient. And Stroke. when they do, it's called percuss actually. We have it on our website. 
on Islam's Women. If anybody want to go to the website, islamswomen.com. Is Islam's yeah. Okay. Uh, but anyway, this is where a man actually taps his own hand. So even if you went up and said like that, but it's your own hand you hit, but not her. You can't do that. You can't leave a mark on her. You can't slap her face. You can't do it. This is forbidden in Islam. And more than likely, though, it also implies a stronger admonition toward correcting a problem. Okay, well, we've run out of time once again, unfortunately. We've spoken a lot about women, uh, Islam and women. Thank you very much to the studio audience. Thank you again, Sheikh Estes. Thank you for uh, watching uh, Misconceptions and uh, Islam's Women. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If you ask me who my prophet is, I will say, haven't you heard his name is Muhammad? A mercy to the world, a mercy to the world. If you ask me who my enemy is, I will say, don't you know? If you ask me who my enemy is, He's that same old devil, that same old devil.